This is Seeking Delphi, episode number 50, Future Minds with Richard Yonk. I'm Mark Sackler. The future lives here. Richard Yonk is a futurist author and fellow member of the Association of Professional Futurists. This is his second visit with us on Seeking Delphi. Three years ago, he joined me to discuss his first book, Heart of the Machine, which took an in-depth look at the emerging field of emotion AI. That's artificial intelligence that can recognize and react appropriately to human emotion. For his second book, Future Minds, it's a bit of an understatement to say that he's taken a much broader look at the question of intelligence of all kinds, human and otherwise. So always a pleasure to welcome back author and fellow Association of Professional Futurists member Richard Young. Richard, thanks for joining me again on Seeking Delphi. Thanks very much, Mark. Very, uh, really looking forward to today and uh, appreciate you having me back. So the subject today is going to be your second book, Future Minds. It's a, a very broad topic to say that it covers a broader scope than your first book, Heart of the Machine, is an understatement. Go from talking about the current state and future development of emotion AI or the ability of artificial intelligence or machines to recognize human emotion to all of intelligence in, in all of its machine and human and even animal form. So what brought you to this? Was this kind of a natural evolution from the first book? Uh, yeah, it, uh, very definitely, Mark. In For years, I've been researching, looking at intelligence as part of my future's work, uh, what it means for society, what it means for our future as a species. And there's a lot of different directions, a lot of different aspects to this that need to be explored, I feel. After the last book, After Heart of the Machine, it definitely went into different aspects of AI and where that could ultimately go, uh, some aspects about future superintelligence and uh, AI consciousness, which we may talk about a little later. But in sort of extending or moving on from that, I felt that this is a much bigger topic. It's something I wanted to explore in terms of what it means for the universe, what it means for us. Uh, We've had some big questions for a very long time about what is our place in the universe? Are are we alone? Are are the, there is it teeming with other species and intelligences that we may one day meet? All of that remains very much speculation. Uh, it's very very difficult at this point for us to know. So, in terms of beginning the book, a book about intelligence, I wanted to really ask the first very basic question: What is intelligence anyway? And so that's where it all begins from, and I'm happy to talk about that uh, in some detail if you want. Well, in terms of where it begins from, that calls up the whole scope of this book. And to say that it's bigger in terms of subject matter, it's immense in terms of time, because you literally cover the entire life of the universe from the Big Bang to its potential demise trillions of years in the future. So I'm wondering why such a broad scope and how can the average reader relate to such an expanse? Well, ideally, as a, as a writer and a science writer, I try to make it approachable for readers of all different, you know, where, wherever they come from in terms of prior knowledge and so forth. And in terms of why the scope, though, we often, when we talk about AI, we usually start from the middle of the 20th century. When we talk about intelligence, very often we're looking at the beginnings of our own species. We can obviously look back further at how it originates in other biological species. But in terms of why it exists, it feels like there's a need to go back to first principles. So when I talk about, when you you talk about the word intelligence, it, it refers to all kinds of different things in our world, in our society, in our ecosystem. 
And this is in part because intelligence is what AI pioneer Marvin Minsky used to call a suitcase word, a term that's used for all kinds of different purposes and meanings, and therefore it has many different connotations and associations. So for this book, I began looking at first principles, which really takes you back to the beginning of the universe. And the very basic trends that a lot of different science and research, physics, complexity, uh, other fields have begun to uncover suggest that there are some very interesting commonalities that might be what's driving a lot of this right from the start. You can, when you look at what occurs within thermodynamics, energy flow, probability, there's there are these pockets of complexity and organization that form over very long spans of time, but it happens very consistently. And it's not we, something we recognize as intelligence early on, but it's essentially forms of optimization that are trying to outcompete other forms, whether they're organic or not. And ultimately, those that are the most successful, those that promote what I call and what some physicists call uh, future freedom of action, is the idea that they are able to actually promote in one manner or another their own continuation into the future. And that is what ultimately we start to recognize as intelligence. That explains the development. Let's maybe move on to a time frame that we can grasp a more immediate future. And uh, sure. in the framework of the book that you discussed, that could easily be a billion years, but most of us can't, as you say, fathom that. So let's get down to something more within the range of what we can put our minds around extrapolating from our daily life, maybe the next few decades to the rest of this century. You say we're going to become more and differently intelligent. And I'd be curious to know exactly what you're getting in it with that. How so more and how so differently? Great question. And yes, I do use that phrase very often in talking about this book and the general trends that we're looking at. More intelligent is something that is a function of, of several different developments. Our, as we have developed technology, over, it's become more and more apparent in recent years and decades that not only are some of the things that we're developing possibly themselves going to be considered intelligent, we talk about smart homes, smart cities, and so forth, they're actually becoming more and more autonomous, more and more capable of taking action themselves. But when you combine this with our own intelligence, whether you're blending it or augmenting it, whether you're using a computer or a smartphone or other devices that may, over time, integrate even more closely with us, these are ways that we ourselves are going to become more intelligent. As far as the differently intelligent, it's a recognition that AI is not going to replicate human intelligence. As much as we try, it begins from a very, very different beginning, a very different substrate. And so it's really much more useful and much more likely that we will continue to develop it for many decades to come in such a way that while it will be a tool for us, while it can be a partner, it will not be the equivalent of human intelligence. It may exceed us in certain respects, but it won't emulate us that well for quite some time. Dude, that kind of conjures up to me an image from, I think, when you really start to get into the what you call next milestones, what's going to be happening in the more immediate future over the next few decades, a scenario that you called up here. And your scenarios, I remember from Heart of the Machine, you have some pretty provocative ones. You have a scenario with a woman actually marrying an artificially intelligent robot, <laughs> which is sounds like they are pretty pretty human-like, but that's maybe a debate for a different a different discussion. But give us a scenario at the beginning of that chapter eight to launch into this where you describe a situation, you've got a mother and the mother is interacting with what sounds like a small child, maybe three, four, five years old at the most and learning which identifying animals, whatever. And toward the end of that little story, you reveal that she's not interacting with the child. She's 
uh, interacting with a learning bot that's kind of cute. Maybe it has a physical form that looks a little childlike. Immediately to me, that conjures up memories of Steven Spielberg's 2001 film, AI Artificial Intelligence. I, I wonder why you chose this particularly provocative example. What point are you uh, trying to make here? And is this something uh, that you think we are going to confront at any time in the future? Great question. It's meant to evoke some ideas and some thoughts around the idea of computers learning in a way that is much more like us. Now, this is going to be a little long-winded as a, as a uh, response, but we have been in the midst for three quarters of a century, probably longer, of an ongoing trend of interacting with our devices, interacting with our computers in ever more natural ways. When computers began uh, being created, they were hardwired. They, uh, we then moved on to punch cards, punch tape, the command line interface. By the 80s, we were starting to have graphic user interfaces. And these days, we're interacting with them more and more in terms of natural user interfaces. This is language. This is emotion. This is touch and gesture and so forth. And as we have been developing these technologies, we've been working to make them operate more and more on our terms, not just so they can be like us, that's not really their true value, but so that they can interact with and learn from us in ways that are more conducive to us, requiring less and less uh, specialized, capabilities and knowledge. Now, we have been, during that time that I just described, we moved in AI from the mid 50s, uh, mid 1950s, uh, from a period where we were in what was known as the first wave of AI, uh, which was symbolist, it was go fight, what was, it was, it was hard coded rules, basically. Uh, Later, in the later part of the century, we began, we began to develop and work with neural networks, connectionist AI, that instead of being quite so narrow and rule-based, was more and more about pattern recognition. We are now moving into what some people are calling a third wave of AI. And this is AI that is much more engaged in abstract reasoning, and there are a lot of different areas that this is looking to uh, work in and achieve, and there's a lot of different projects and programs going on, but this, this, uh, these developments are looking to have the technology have a much better understanding of context, context. what is relevant, what is not uh, important in a particular situation. This is going to go a long way to making AI more transparent, more explainable, have it actually make more sense of what we're trying to have it accomplish, have a better understanding of common sense and causality and all that. Now, part of that, to come back to your question now, is about being able to teach AI much more in a, a way that learns like we do, a way that in learning not just through a program, but through continual interaction and engagement with its world environment. That means interacting with people, interacting with its physicality, its, its, its actual environment, in order to gradually build up an entire base of knowledge, much like we do from infancy, where we are acquiring a understanding of cause and effect. I pick up a ball, I drop it, it falls to the ground. It doesn't suddenly float off in the air unless it's filled with helium. And these kinds of understandings of these types of relationship, our relationship to the environment, to each other, is very much a key aspect of our intelligence. And that's more and more what's being done in certain programs. There are programs known as in one case, uh, DARF is working on a program called L2M, Lifelong Learning Machines. And these are essentially systems that are being worked on to, to acquire knowledge much more like people do. Because unfortunately, when you 
train something like a neural network, it's great for that one, one particular task, but then when you go to retrain it, it suffers from what's often called catastrophic, per, catastrophic forgetting, and all of a sudden, what it has learned previously is useless to it. it. It's basically you're starting from scratch. This is not how we learn. We build in increments. We accrete knowledge over time. And that's what some of that scenario, but some of that concept of L2M, uh, lifelong learning machines, is about. Well, that immediately recalls uh, particularly some scus discussions I've had on this podcast with Jerome Glenn from the Millennium Project about the distinction between narrow artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. And of course, narrow artificial intelligence can be programmed to do better than a human in a very narrow field, playing chess or Go, maybe uh, doing scheduling, for example. But general artificial intelligence has to be able to learn new things. Uh, if I want to learn how to play chess, and I don't currently know, I get out a couple of books, I watch some videos, and I start learning to play chess. If I want to learn auto mechanics, you know, I can do something similar. Uh, generally, AI hasn't been able to do that. Now, it sounds to me like what you're discussing with the lifetime learning, is that the bridge to the next step of general AI, or we still have some way to, to go beyond that? I'd say it's a bridge, but I'd also say it's we have quite some way to go beyond that. Uh, general intelligence is one of those, when, especially when we talk about it in terms of AI, is a really interesting concept and one that we have to be very careful about how we use it and, and refer to it. We talk about general intelligence as if we are, we human beings, are what defines general intelligence. But we really have a very, very specific set of intelligence ourselves. The, not the, the intelligence we have is a function of our place in the ecological system, our, our place in the ecological niche. And in fact, a number of people, including uh, Stephen Pinker, have talked about our occupying what is essentially a cognitive niche that allows us to operate very, very successfully in our environment, in the world. But this is not to say that we have general intelligence. There are all kinds of things we don't learn particularly well. We don't, aren't able to navigate in the air in three dimensions the way, you know, with anything like the natural method that a, a bird or a bat does. There's all kinds of different examples to use here, but we, we, our supposed general intelligence is actually rife with all kinds of cognitive biases that we've accumulated through evolution, all kinds of different things that actually we could do a lot better. Some other devices could do a lot better. So going to have a device that absolutely emulates human general intelligence is not necessarily the, the answer in putting all this energy into a tool. We talk about AGI, artificial general intelligence, as this kind of grail that we're working toward. And it's it's a fine goal. It has a range of dangers that we many of us have discussed over the years. But we also have to recognize that as we make anything more and more general as an intelligence, by its very nature, it means that it is less optimized for the specialization that it previously or could have otherwise been programmed for. So uh, something that, uh, this, this has been actually played out in, in with certain kinds of game learning neural nets where they have been working toward not losing all of the knowledge from a prior game and being able to apply it to future games that are, are learned by that system. The problem is, while it, it can do this, it doesn't ultimately play the new game as optimally as it would play if it had begun from total scratch, because it was not specialized and optimized for that new purpose the way that the original system might have been. 
in interesting in that, of course, uh, one of the reasons we create artificial intelligence is so they can better do things that we can't do or can't do as well. So that, that certainly makes up. And that brings us to one of the more controversial issues that we're seeing more and more of right now, more and more being accomplished and more and more uh, initiatives out there. And of course, that's brain-computer interface. Mm -hmm. Recently, I had Laura Cabrera, who's a consultant to the IEEE Brain Initiative on, and we discussed that. And it was kind of a more of a short-term discussion about how maybe what some of the ethics might be, but more about what can we can do right now and how we can do it. But in the context of your book, of course, the question is, how specifically might brain-computer interface enhance our intelligence, and, and how might it change our intelligence? So I, I, what are the implications? That's what we're really interested in here today. Well, this is an ongoing continuation of ex exactly what I was talking about before in terms of as we have moved through the computer age, we've been building systems interfaces that allow us to interact more and more immediately, more and more naturally with our computers, our systems, our devices. And a, a, a BCI, a brain computer interface, is essentially a continuation of this trend. And this is something that's been underway for quite a number of decades. Uh, DARPA uh, began uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, stimulate some of the research uh, back in the even the 70s uh, based on uh, some of the early EEG work from earlier in the century. This developed into more and more capable invasive BCIs. BCIs fall into about three different main categories. Invasive, which are putting literally probes into our brains and into neurons. Partially invasive, that kind of sit on top of, inside the skull, but on top of the brain, not actually penetrating into it. And those that are non-invasive, that such as an EEG that can read through the skin. Now, as our technologies have gotten better in recent decades, and our computers have been cap more and more capable of learning and reading what had been seen initially as a very, very noisy and almost useless signal, we've be become able to develop more and more capable non-invasive systems, but still the more invasive or partially invasive systems that we develop typically have better spatial resolution and temporal resolution, which essentially means they can pick up the signal from an individual neuron much more accurately and do it in much smaller increments of time. So picking up millisecond changes is much more useful than being able to detect a change that happens every tenth of a second or every second. So all of those contribute to the benefits of different aspects of BCIs. And right now, work has been done for a few decades now where we have systems that can help replace and repair lost physical and cognitive function, systems that can be used to operate wheelchairs, prosthetics, neuroprosthetics, being able to communicate on a computer screen for people with locked-in syndrome to actually be able to communicate and interact through that. We've had the last decade different work at different research labs and universities where different forms of communication, sending tweets, sending messages, using thoughts, or even re receiving them via brainwaves have been accomplished. It's still very, very early, still very rudimentary, but they do point in a direction for where, we're, where we are ultimately going. So we also at this point have a number of technologies that are being developed that are essentially a little more science fiction based. Elon Musk has the Neuralink company working on Neuralace. Kernel, I believe, is still working on their form of BCI uh, and others as well. And initially, these are for being able to use, be used for therapeutic purposes to be able to help with things like depression and PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and so forth, our disorder. All of these are really important and good end uses, but these companies also have stated that they ultimately want to see this as a means of enhancing 
our own capabilities, being able to integrate and tie our thoughts into other resources, other computing capabilities, and so forth. While that sounds very dehumanizing and science fiction based, really, that's just one more step away from what we're talking about with interacting with our smartphones, interacting with smart glasses, and so forth. It's just that we're using thought instead of touch or eye movements and so forth. Well, that kind of brings us to one last question here, going back to the Elon Musk neural link, because one of his claimed motivations for that, based off of his and maybe Stephen Hawking's warning that artificial intelligence may become a threat to us if it outstrips us, and he thinks maybe we can control it better by merging with it. And that, that also suggests the question of whether the hard question of consciousness, will it become conscious or can it be a threat even if it's not conscious? I, I'm just curious in general, your th thoughts on, on those ideas, or is it just too far out there at this point? Well, from it, it's too far out for a lot of general day-to-day -day business thinking and so forth. But as a futurist, that is really what we do. We, we explore where are things going, how can they develop, try to understand what are the potential ramifications early on in order to protect ourselves down the way. There's a lot of different benefits to that. And this is certainly a serious enough potential development that we need to be talking about and exploring it. Now that said, there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainties that go along with that. Will we achieve some level of artificial general intelligence that ultimately takes off, self-improves, becomes what is known sometimes as a super intelligence? That is still out. There's, it's really hard to say if we're actually going to achieve that. Part of that, the reason is especially for things like consciousness, is that we may not be beginning from a fundamentally basic and intelligent enough component, a, a transistor, a set of transistors, a set of circuits, no matter how well you emulate something like a neuron, is not capturing all of the necessary, all, no, I won't say necessary, all of the features and aspects and functions of that. They're be able to do that, we literally have to re you know, break it down and recreate a neuron almost at, a, at an atomic level. Do we need to be able to have that level of emulation? That's another question. There may be certain points where we actually achieve a certain levels of intelligence. We may not necessarily shift over to something that is fully conscious or that we would recognize as conscious. And then, of course, we also get into the whole question of how can we know that a system or a machine is conscious. We talk about that with regard that problem with regard to animals, and even some philosophers have gone into what's known as solipsism, where they question, well, we really can't know that anyone else is conscious, and that sort of gets into some rather silly aspects of philosophy, really. But ultimately, we can't measure a something as subjective as consciousness in a machine and whether or not it tells us it's conscious may or may not actually be true. And I have to say that that's been one of my points as well, and I hope to have somebody on to talk about in detail that in, in, in a, the near future, but how do you know what, that it's just not doing a good job of acting like it's conscious? And it's not exactly the same thing as human solipsism, because we know at least that everybody else is hopefully made out of the same flesh and blood that we, we are. Uh, right. And they are, you know, they are different, regardless of how intelligent they are. Well, Richard, as always, it is a pleasure to have you on. Future Minds was a pleasure to read, and I encourage all of our audience to to seek it out and, and seek all of Richard's thinking out because it is very insightful in these areas. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure and I appreciate your talking to me about Future Minds.
Appropriate links, including the Future Minds page on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com, are available on the web page for this podcast at www.seekingdelphi.com. I, for one, am looking forward to Richard's next book, wherever that might lead him and us. Be sure to subscribe to Seeking Delphi on Apple Podcasts, Player FM, or YouTube, and to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for joining me. Here's to the next 50 episodes. My technical assistant is Mohamed Marouf. Until next time, I'm Mark Sackler.